bir YouTube açalım. Ben ufakça konuşmaya başlayayım. E, okay, everyone, we are just starting and we are opening YouTube channel and also I'm going to start to introduce you first and then Dejan is going to keep on. Okay. All right. Uh, first, I'm going to talk in Turkish for a while and then I'm going to translate it. Herkese merhaba. Uh, Türkiye'den katılanlara merhaba, Türkçe konuşanlara. Bu akşam üç önemli konuşmacımız var. Avrupa'nın önde gelen hepatopankreatiko biliyar cerrahlarından, uh, Belgrad'dan Dejan Redenkovic, Viyana'dan Olivier Strobel and Fransa Lyon'dan Mustafa Adam. Uh, bizimle uh, kompleks pankreatik cerrahi konusunda deneyimlerini paylaşacaklar. Um, i̇zin verirseniz yurt dışından katılımcılarımız olduğu için İngilizce bir sunum yapmam gerekecek. Hello everyone, um, welcome to Turkish HPB Society webinar regarding complex pancreatic surgery. We have three well-known famous speakers from Europe. Um, thanks uh, all of them to participate in this webinar and accept our invitation. Uh, the first speaker is going to be Dejan Redankovic. Then we are going to uh, listen Olivier Strobel uh, from Vienna, and then finally Mustafa Adam regarding ERAS. The um, Dejan is professor of surgery in the School of Medicine, University of Belgrade, and he is the vice chief of HPV Department of Surgery. He is also the head of pre uh, postgraduate studies in surgery in School of Medicine, University of Belgrade, and he is very active in societies like EHVBA, Pancreatic Club, and Serbian uh, surgical societies. Also, he is member of a lot of journals, uh, editorial boards like Langan Max Archives of Surgery, and also he's a member of European Digestive Surgery. And uh, Olivier Strobel is recently moved to Vienna, University of Vienna from Germany, and now he is uh, the head of Department of General Surgery and Division of Visceral Surgery in University of Vienna. And the and all we know because we had him before. Actually, we all had all of them in Turkey before. And Mustafa Adam from Lyon, and he, he is from University of Lyon, and also he is a president of Eras Society in Europe, and one of the most leading figures in Eras and HPB surgery in Europe. And thanks again for participation. And first, we are ready to listen Dejan Redankovic first. He is going to talk about the multivisceral resection in uh, pancreatic surgery. Yes, Dejan, we are all listening to you. Ready to share your screen? Okay. Is it okay? Can you see my, my screen? Yes, we can see that. You can keep okay. going. Okay, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's my great pleasure and honor to, play, uh, to participate in this virtual meeting of Turkish HPB, and I would like to respect my deep thankful to Professor Ahmed Çakir for more than kind invitation and honor. Merhaba Sevgili Arkadaşu. On behalf of Communication Committee of EHPBA, I would like to invite all of you on the meeting of our association, which will be held from 15th to 17th of September, unfortunately, virtually this time from Bilbao. Please, all uh, particip participants, save this date in your calendar, since we expect an extraordinary Congress in Bilbao with a nice scientific program. My uh, today talk is a multivisceral resection for pancreatic cancer. And treatment, as all of you know, treatment of pancreatic cancer are improved tremendously during the last decade. One of the best examples is Prodigy 24 study, which showed remarkable results on median disease-free survival of 21 months and median overall survival of 54.4 months for modified folfirinox group. Uh, as adjuvant therapy after the surgery. But we cannot behave like a guy in this small boat and to be relaxed and the sharks is around beside this very nice result because nowadays around 75% of our patient with pancreas cancer will die within a year. Five year survival barely reach seven to 9%. In metastatic setting, five year survival is poorly, poorly 2.6%. 
And all of us should bear in mind that surgical, remo surgical removal is only potentially curative options. Nowadays, all patients with pancreas cancer could be divided in four groups. Patients who need multivisceral resection is somewhere in between borderline, locally advanced, and in some cases, those with oligometastatic disease, like in when the liver cancer, liver uh, meds, when this patient should be also resected. To accurately predict prognosis and decide appropriate treatment options, it is vital to describe the extent of disease. The satisfactions into the correct prognostic stage group is therefore of paramount importance. However, with change in management of a particular aggressive biology seen in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, it is questions whether such referments is the true progress or just merely shuffles the card. Multivisceral resection should be strictly defined as those resections that include removal of adjacent viscera that are not normally removed during the course of the operation but in whom the gross involvement by the tumor entails their resection and block to achieve an R0 status. According to the International Study Group on Pancreas Surgery, the majority of our patients do not present with early disease, thus precluding the chance of cure by standard approach. And therefore, the, the International Study Group uh, published their uh, definition of the organs it should be removed if we would like to speak about extended or multivisceral resection. In that extended pancreatectomy, it's added also near vessels, but for the organs, this is, as you can see on the left hand side, more than antrum of distal half of the stomach, colon, small blood, right adrenal gland, right kidney, liver, and diaphragmatic cura. The aim of these resections has to be. Uh, uh, has to be to determine uh, whether obtaining a complete removal by extending the limits of conventional surgery in patients with advanced disease will yield a result which we can see in the resection in all, alone in the early disease. In this slide, this is three phases for all new procedure in surgical mind, especially in our surgical mind, and it passed three phases. First phase is it can't be done. Second one, it should not be done. And finally, I can do it. So uh, surgeons are very rarely in position like small animal on the meme on left hand side, on the right hand side. We need, we need to wait uh, what is better therapeutic options for every particular patient to leave tumor in situ or to perform multivisceral resections. In favor of resections is that it offers better survival than any palliative surgery or treatment. In selected patients may increase the resectability rate and its performance has increased steadily in the recent years. But on the other uh, hand side, there is no clear consensus on the oncolog oncological benefits. It carries higher mortality and mortality rates and there is no clear protocols for new adjuvant therapy which is necessary for the patients with locally advanced disease. One of the earliest and biggest experience from multivisceral resection coming as usually from Heidelberg. They analyzed more than 600 patients with multivisceral resections and the most uh, frequently resected organs beside vascular resections were colon, stomach, adrenal gland, small bowel and kidney. 30 day and in hospital mortality rates were significantly higher compared with the rate for the standard pancreatectomy, with significantly increased duration of surgery, blood loss, need for transfusion, non-surgical and surgical morbidity, and longer duration of ICU and hospital stay. In their study, overall survival was significantly impaired compared with, stand, uh, with the death for the standard resections. An, obvi an obvious contributor to their inferior survival were tumor biology, Two or, more, uh, two or more positive lymph nodes, microscopic positive resection margins, operative time more than seven hours, and high blood loss. However, median survival of the patient in this study was markedly better than for any palliative treatment. Therefore, on conclusion, uh, they suggested the surgeons should let the patient know about the increased perioperative risk and to select the patients for these uh, procedures very carefully. In the systematic review, 
published two and a half years ago, just three studies evaluating the outcome standard in multivisceral pancreatic resections for malignancies uh, of the pancreas were included. These studies were published between two, uh, 2009 and 2015. Venous resection was not considered at multivisceral and only patients with pancreatic malignancy were included. A total of 889 patients were analyzed, of which 20% underwent multivisceral resections. All included studies were single institution, retrospective reports, and it comings from Germany, all studies. The extent of multivisceral resection and the resected organs for each study are presented on table on your right-hand side. And you can see, again, stomach, colon, liver, kidney, small bowel, and adrenal which were most frequently resected organs. The systematic review published on this topic revealed that intraoperative trans, uh, transfusion and operative time more than six, uh, five hours and, uh, and kidney resection are the most important factor which could predict morbidity and mortality. While advanced nodal disease, T stage, positive resection margin, high intraoperative blood transfusion, transfusion significantly influenced worse survival. Spirin, uh, Spirin, uh, Pong from Michigan, US, analyzed group of 47 patients, including people and distal leak sections. Although multivisceral resections were associated with longer operative time compared to standard uh, resection, there was no significant difference in rates of, of overall surgical morbidity. Those in multivisceral group, however, were more likely to have non-surgical complications. In hospital mortality and 30 day mortality rates were similar between the standard and multivisceral group, but there were no significant difference in 30 day readmission rate. Overall, patients in standard resection had a longer medial survival compared with those in multivisceral group. Even when, even when stratified by the type of operation, multivisceral resections consist, uh, consistently demonstrate the inferior survival. This uh, flow chart show concert diagram of 683 patients, consecutive patients uh, resected in Mumbai, India, and it was analyzed retrospectively. Uh, in their group, there were 63 uh, patients with uh, uh, multivisceral resections and 620 patients with standard resection. In this study, multivisceral resection were associated with significantly higher blood loss, number of units of blood transfusion, need for blood transfusion and duration of surgery. However, overall multivisceral resections had similar hospital stay, perioperative morbidity and mortality and readmission rate and standard pancreatic resections. But when pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma group was analyzed, perioperative uh, uh, mortality and morbidity for multivisceral resection were significantly higher than those undergoing standard resections, as well as R1 resections. And uh, multivisceral resections was associated with a high, significantly uh, lower disease free survival in this group. Uh, group Ferona retrospectively also analyzed data of the patients, but only with distal pancreatectomy associated with multivisceral resections over a nine year period and compared them to standard uh, procedure of distal pancreatectomy. Out of 508 distal pancreatectomies. In, five, uh, in uh, 59 cases, multivisceral resection were performed. The absolute incidence of complications was comparable between the two groups, but more patients in multivisceral group had clavian dindo more than three uh, class complications. A longer operative time and increased need for intraoperative transfusions as a slightly longer hospitalization were observed in the multivisceral group. In patients, with ductal adenocarcinoma, mortality rates was comparable between groups over a median follow-up of 26 months. In contrast, among the patients with new endocrine neoplasma, uh, mortality was higher in the study group. Very similar study coming from Charité Berlin uh, in Germany. They compared 126 patients undergoing distal pancreatectomy and multivisceral resection, and they match it with 126 patients uh, undergoing distal pancreatectomy as a controls. 
most frequently resected organs were stomach, liver, colon, and left adrenals. Rate of postoperative pancreatic fistula and postpancreatectomy hemorrhage not reveal any significant difference in their study. Although operative time and the necessity for intraoperative transfusion was significantly higher, the number of patients with major complications, again, Clavia and Dindo more than true, was not increased. Midterm survival indicated no significant difference for adenocarcinoma and new endocrine tumors for the either group. Group from Seoul, Korea, compared 523 patients received standard distal pancreatectomy and only 40 with a multivisceral in 10-year period. The multivisceral group uh, had a significantly long, longer mean operative time, but there was no difference in estimated blood loss, post-operative hospital stay, major complications, pancreatic fistula, and 90-day mortality. There was significant difference in disease-free uh, survival by Kaplan-Meier uh, estimator. One of the quite reasonable explanations could be that implementation uh, rate of adjuvant uh, chemotherapy in the uh, multivisceral group was lower than in standard group. Most patients in the multivisceral group underwent com combined gastrointestinal complicated surgery involving the colon, stomach, and small intestine, as it can cause poor oral intake and general condition in patients that, com that combined gastrointestinal surgery could be cause of the lower implementation rate of adjuvant chemotherapy and authors concluded that distal pancreatectomy with uh, multivisceral resections could be a good surgical treatment. Standard group. Retrospective multi center study from six centers from Spain and two centers from Puerto Rico included 435 distal pancreatectomies from whom 62 received multivisceral resection for 10 years. Patient with celiac trans resection or RPLB procedure, portal vein resection or cholecystectomy were excluded. Major morbidity rates and mortality were significantly higher in the multivisceral group, while pancreatic fistula rates were particularly the same in the both groups. Mean hospital stay and readmission rate were also higher in multivisceral group. Patients in multivisceral resections had significantly shorter survival. Nevertheless, authors concluded that in order to obtain uh, free margins or treat pathologies in several organs, uh, distal pancreatectomy combined with multivisceral resections is feasible techniques in selected group of patients. An international multicenter propensity match score, including patients who underwent either laparoscopic or open distal pancreatectomy for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, was performed by European Consortium for Minimal Invasive Pancreas Surgery. Patients were included from 34 centers in 11 European countries and one center from US. After screening of nearly three, uh, 1,300 patients, with distal pancreatectomy, they matched just 44 patients in open and 44 patients in laparoscopic group who received multivisceral resections. Uh, in their result, conversions uh, from laparoscopy to open occurred in 35%. Additional resections and, vis uh, and vascular resections were comparable between the open and laparoscopic group. Lower rate of gerotofascia resection and lower median number of lymph nodes retrieved was observed in the laparoscopic, while the R0 resection rate was comparable. However, laparoscopic group showed a lower rate of positive circumferential margins. Postoperative complications were comparable between the groups, and hospital stay was four days shorter after laparoscopic approach. The median overall survival was 19 months after laparoscopic and 20 months after open surgery. Author concluded that. Uh, that uh, result of this study suggests comparable outcome, sorry, comparable outcome of the laparoscopic uh, compared to open approach for multivisceral resection, despite the high conversion rate and lower lymph node retrieval. Dear colleagues, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, multivisceral pancreatectomies are feasible and may increase number of completely resected patients. Morbidity and mortality are higher than after standard pancreatectomies. 
These procedures should be reserved for very selected group of patients in referral centers and further studies of the role of neoadjuvant therapy in these, sectors, in these settings are advisable. And in the world of surgical oncology, biology is a king, selection of the cases is a queen, and technical maneuvers or surgeons are the princes and prince. Occasionally, the prince and princess try to usurp the throne, usually no long-term avail, although with some temporary apparent victories. That was the words of Black KD American surgeons, and it said it 1997. And once more, I would like to invite all of you for our virtual meeting of VHPBA in 15th for 17th September, which will be held from Bilbao, Spain. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dejan. Um, as we committed before, we are going to receive questions at the end of every speak. And um, I have a couple of questions for you, Dejan. And the first one, uh, how about the oligometastatic pancreatic cancer? Uh, is it, uh, does it make any advantages over the multi-metastatic uh, or multi-visceral resections? For example, if we resect the distal pancreas with colon, either colon or colon plus liver left lobe, for example, which one is much more advantageous? The number of organs removed make any problem at the end of operation or in terms of prognosis? I think that in terms of prognosis, uh, all this, this is my personal view that all these patients should, should be uh, first of all on the neoadjuvant treatment and these patients need and after the response to neoadjuvant treatment of course if it's a, let's say stable disease there is in the very selected group young patients fit for surgery i think there is indication for the uh, both liver resection and the colon resection but in very selected group of patients and after the neoadjuvant treatment for sure from my Okay. Yeah, and also related with this question again, um, any uh, some organs may be much more advantageous than the others. Do you think that it's? Yeah, yeah. Example, I you know, think yeah. Uh, I think that uh, um, especially liver is special case, and uh, you know if we are talking about the uh, uh, multivisceral resection, mainly it means that is local organs which is involved by the tumor. And it's, from my point of view, more the po uh, position of the tumor than, uh, than, than the uh, biology of disease. But in the patients with liver meds, it will mean that it's uh, aggressive biology and very few of them can receive the surgery. But uh, from the, for example, colon or adrenal, especially in distal pancreatectomy or uh, stomach, it could be from the position of the tumor, not defining the bi biology. Okay. And another one, do you have any biological marker um, in order to... Uh... Unfortunately, I think no out of the CA99, this is, and, and this is the studies, just study about the circulating DNA, but I think that it's still not in routine use anywhere in the world. Okay, all right. And the last two And questions. also after, after, sorry, and after the resection, it could be the tumor stage and the TNM classification, but like biological mycotic CA99 is still the only on which we have it. Okay. And last two questions. Um, during an operation, during an operation, if you detect just a small mess on the peritoneum or, uh, or just adjacent to the pancreas, for example, left lobe of the liver, and if you cannot see before an operation, either on, neither on a PET scan nor other uh, radiation techniques, do you consider it is multivisceral resection or just metastatic disease or what, how's your attitude? Yeah, uh, generally and academically, I would consider it like metastatic disease. That's my, that's my view. But as a surgeon, for sure, I, if I can see just two small spots or something, I think that everywhere in the world, surger, surgeons will take it out. Yeah. But if you want to take strictly according to study, to academia, then it means that it is more advanced disease, especially in peritoneal seedings. But uh, if you are quite sure that it's just, it's the same story like lymph nodes, parotic lymph nodes, that it means that it's advanced disease, metastatic disease, but 
I think that very rarely surgeon will stop surgery if they found the preorto uh, lymph node that is positive. Yeah, this question was raised in year 2003 in Istanbul during an European HPV Congress uh, to the speaker, and the answer was the same. So in the last 20 years, almost 20 years, nothing has changed, we can say then. And this is my just personal opinion. I don't have any studies, but I think that very rarely, but it happens that reality and theory are not the same for the surgery. Okay. And uh, the last question, uh, how, uh, why the neuroendocrine tumors uh, were worse than the others during a multivisceral resection? Because in your presentation, in your literature review, that was like that. And yeah, I was wondering. As as, you know, uh, the biological behavior of neuroendocrine tumors are better than the others. Yeah, but I think that uh, because uh, in the pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, it, adenocarcinoma, the survival rate is mainly similar in big numbers, you know, and its its median survival is 20 or as we saw 35 months. In new endocrine tumors, when you have simple distal pancreatectomy, it, complete, it can be completely uh, removed and they have chance for definitive cure. But if you have local, uh, if you have locally advanced with multivisceral resection, then complications come on the table and they will define the survival rate. That's my explanation. Said, yeah, thank you. The, I said last one, but we have got one more from Spain, from Alejandro. If the, if the necessity of multivisceral resection is showed into operating theater in laparoscopic exploration and uh, do you how you manage how do you manage it uh, if the node sample are positive uh, in neoadjuvant patient for example you have a patient with neoadjuvant chemotherapy and you have taken him to the operating theater and then during an laparoscopic exploration if you detect any positive nodes do you stop the, doing an operation or just keep going on of course, it depends which nodes, uh, which nodes is positive. Uh, you think peritoneal nodes or the lymph nodes of some groups? Let, let's assume the peritoneal nodes. If it's peritoneal nodes, I will stop it. Okay. All right. It means that the incurable. All right. Yeah. If if it's after new adjuvant, still you have the new peritoneal nodes. I think that it means that it's systematic disease, okay. especially under the new adjuvant treatment. And. Do you have any peritonectomy experience about that? Is the hyper? No, no, me personally not. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, I think our time is up. Thank you, Dejan, for your excellent presentation as usual. And we have learned a lot again. And uh, if you don't mind, we are going to switch to another precious speaker. Of course, Thanks. thank you very much again for opportunity. It was great pleasure. And regards to all my friends in all over the Turkey. Yeah, same to you, thank you. Uh, on behalf of all my society. And the second uh, second uh, speaker is uh, going to be Oliver Strobel, my friend from Vienna, Austria. And he is going to talk about the reoperative surgery in pancreas or redo surgery in another way. And thank you, Oliver. Uh, thank you, Ahmad. Uh, can, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, there is no problem, yeah. Okay, um, so uh, it is my big pleasure to, to uh, participate uh, in this webinar series of the HPB uh, Turkish uh, Society. And um, <clears throat> I thank you for the invitation. Um, so my topic is redo pancreatic surgery. Um, I am, as you have, uh, uh, announced uh, and now uh, working in Vienna since three months, but I was working uh, in Heidelberg for over 20 years and uh, could there um, um, collect my experience in pancreatic surgery and uh, much of the data I will present is of course from Heidelberg. Uh, so first I would like to talk about the spectrum of indications for redo pancreatic surgery. Um, First, uh, there is of course disease recurrence, uh, most importantly of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, but uh, also an important indication, which we see more and more is a recurrence of IPMN, um, receiving partial pancreatectomy and not total pancreatectomy in the first 
operation, uh, then uh, redo surgery in after pancreatic surgery may be necessary for long-term complications of pancreatic surgery, such as the noses of the pancreatic gochechonostomy and hepatic gochechonostomy. Uh, and last but not least, uh, it may also be necessary to do redo pancreatic surgery for complication management after pancreatic surgery uh, in the context of uncontrolled postoperative pancreatic fistula, especially in the setting of post-pancreatectomy uh, hemorrhage um, um, in the case of fistula, and also for post-pancreatectomy acute pancreatitis, an entity which is increasingly acknowledged, and there will also be a definition by the International Study Group of Pancreatic Surgery. Um, so to tr uh, I will now focus uh, in this talk on uh, redo pancreatic resections for uh, isolated local recurrence of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And uh, to, um, to treat this, of course, uh, you have to diagnose it. 20 years ago, there were several uh, papers uh, discussing that it's not possible to uh, detect early local recurrence. So you will only detect a recurrence when it's already systemic disease. And uh, the thinking was uh, there is po uh, postoperative changes uh, in uh, the uh, abdomen and you cannot distinguish between these postoperative changes, scarring and so on, and disease recurrence. And also um, other people said there is no predilection sites. So uh, in Heidelberg, we looked into this with our colleagues from radiology and uh, we found that uh, there is a predilection sites for uh, recurrent pancreatic uh, cancer, not uh, in the first place in the pancreatic remnant, but a perivascular around the celiac axis and the supramesenteric artery. Um, and you can detect this nicely if you do uh, longitudinal uh, follow-up studies and compare uh, the, the, the imaging. Here you can see the celiac trunk uh, and uh, the SMA, and uh, there is no um, dense tissue uh, around it. Um, so this is uneventful after three months. Uh, then after 11 months, there is probably a little bit something, but uh, if you only look at this uh, imaging uh, um, in an isolated fashion, you would not notice it. Uh, and after 22 months uh, now, uh, it becomes evident that uh, there is a uh, local perivascular recurrence here around the celiac trunk, and in this case, around the SMA. Um, similar uh, um, observations can be made for lymph nodes. So this is a paraortic lymph node uh, just below the left renal vein, which is a common site of, of, of metastatic recurrence, lymph node metastatic recurrence and an increase of this lymph node over time. So with this longitudinal follow-up studies and comparisons, you can detect it along with CA99 uh, um, increase. And um, our radiologists uh, mapped this and described these predilection sites in hotspots that uh, one should especially be aware of and, and focus on uh, while looking for recurrence. Um, very recently, or quite recently, uh, the Hopkins group uh, looked at uh, the pattern of recurrence after pancreatic resection in uh, their practice. And uh, while um, many oncologists uh, believe that every pancreatic cancer uh, per se is a systemic disease and therefore also systemic recurrence is dominating, uh, that's true for the majority of patients, but there is a considerable part of the patients that have local recurrence first, uh, here about a quarter of the patients. And uh, this local recurrence, this is the uh, here, the yellow curve occurs later uh, than uh, systemic recurrence. Uh, or in the patients that only have local recurrence, they also have their recurrence later. Um, this is an, a study uh, from the ESPAC group uh, where we reanalyzed uh, or, or reassessed uh, the, the patients uh, included in the ESPAC 4 randomized control trial and looked at their recurrence pattern. 
and their local recurrence occurred in uh, almost half of the patients. Uh, however, uh, the data were collect collected in a way that did not allow to, to look at isolated local recurrence. However, this is an important um, aspect. These are risk factors for local recurrence. And as you can see here, uh, you can decrease the risk also of local recurrence, actually of any recurrence, of course, if you uh, um, give more potent uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, of course, the resection margin status is a risk factor for local recurrence. And then uh, the end stage is a uh, risk factor for local recurrence with increasing numbers of positive lymph nodes, we have more a higher risk of local recurrence. Now this could have several mechanisms. Uh, first of all, this is more advanced disease, but also this could mean one mechanism is that probably the lymph adenectomy uh, was not performed in all these cases in a radical uh, fashion uh, that, that is meanwhile um, uh, propagated. And uh, this then of course is more like a persistence of, of, of tumor of lymph node metastasis that then grow uh, than a true recurrence. So I would like to point out, uh, this is not a uh, situs of a resection of, of a recurrence, but this is of a primary tumor. And this is how it should look. Here you see the SMA, here the celiac trunk. This of course with portal vein resection, but the lymph nodes here are completely gone. If you have after resection, uh, for example, in this position or in this position, a lymph node that is growing and, uh, and, and uh, makes the recurrence, then this is not a true recurrence, but um, more likely a persistence of, of the, the cancer. So what we did in Heidelberg is we did early on, uh, already 20 years ago, three monthly CT scans uh, along with CEA and CA99 uh, determination. And we looked at these hotspots and if uh, there was uh, soft tissue changes uh, in the hotspots together with elevation of tumor markers or in case of negative tumor markers, which can be um, some, some uh, non-secretors, um, uh, we, we did additional PET scans. And uh, if they were positive, we had the diagnosis of local recurrence. And if there was no evidence of systemic progression, we did a re-exploration uh, and resection uh, if uh, the tumor was unresectable or borderline resectable um, with neoadjuvant therapy. And uh, these are the results we reported in 2013 in the first 105 patients. Uh, this is some uh, patient data. What I would like to point out is that the interval between pr the primary tumor resection and uh, the, the redo was 15 months. Uh, most of the patients uh, had ductal adenocarcinoma. There were some pancreatic or biliary type periampillary cancers. Most had pancreatic or duodenectomy, and uh, there were also some initial uh, multivisceral resections. So of the 105 patients, uh, the survival analysis that I will show you include 97 patients with histologic proof of recurrence. In 92% of the patients, uh, the, the suspected recurrence was proven histologically. In eight, this was not proven. Uh, some after neoadjuvant therapy, but those were excluded from the survival analysis. In the patients with histologic proof of recurrence, uh, only 57, this is 59% of these patients had an isolated local recurrence. There was a high rate, 40% of uh, patients with the intraoperative finding of distant metastasis. In most of these patients, uh, the resection was abandoned or not performed. Um, in the patients with isolated local recurrence, 72% um, received the resection with or without uh, intraoperative radiotherapy and 16 did not receive a resection because the tumor was locally unresectable at that time. Probably today we would do many of those resections. So what resections had to be done? Um, importantly, um, 
only 44% of these patients required a pancreatic resection because the, the recurrence was located primarily or did involve the pancreatic remnant. In 56%, uh, no pancreatic resection was necessary, which is important in terms of morbidity. Um, however, necessity of 25% of multivisceral or vascular resections, uh, median postoperative stay of nine days shows that this is actually a, um, a, not a bigger operation or a, a more complicated operations for the, for the patients than uh, the primary surgery. And here you can see one example of such a retroperitoneal lymph node uh, recurrence here the vena cava the aorta uh, here this is after resection and uh, of course this does not require any pancreatic resection um, these are the perioperative results so um, morbidity below 20 percent um, <clears throat> in resections 25 percent and in explorations 10 percent so we do not much harm to these patients. This is also an important aspect by explorations. Mortality, um, one, one patient died due to a perforated gastric ulcer. Um, overall, this can be done safely. Now to the, to the survival results. Uh, this is showing um, patients with isolated local recurrence versus metastatic recurrence, um, so isolated local plus intraoperative refining of metastasis. This is clear, this is biology and not surgery. Uh, however, this is uh, the most important um, uh, figure in, in this, um, um, uh, it was the most important figure in this paper. Uh, these are patients with intraoperatively confirmed isolated local recurrence no evidence of metastatic disease but on thorough uh, exploration. And this is resection, survival after resection, 26 months, and no resection for local unresectability, only 11 months. So, so here we can, although this is not randomized, but controlled, um, say cautiously, uh, re-resection may be associated with prolonged survival. Uh, there is also an association of resection margin status after uh, such a redo surgery. This is R zero is best, although there is some overlap of these survival curves. And CA99 also plays a role in, in uh, the prognostic role in recurrence. However, there is a big overlap of CA99 um, uh, values of patients who have only local recurrence and systemic recurrence. So you cannot really use this to select patients for surgery. Um, in the multivariable analysis, it was independently associated with um, survival after re-resection and in all patients. And therefore it may be, it may contribute to patient selection. I think today we would probably say we would uh, in high C99 levels, also do a neoadjuvant or pseudo neoadjuvant therapy. There is also increasing uh, experience with these redo operations for pancreatic cancer recurrence in other centers. Uh, most are located in Asia. This is uh, a multi-center study from Japan. I think six centers, they looked at 114 patients with isolated a local recurrence in the remnant pancreas. Uh, 90 were resected, 24 were not resected. And you see uh, resection survival is better than in the unresected. Of course, there is a risk of bias here, but in the multi rebel analysis, uh, redo surgery and redo resection uh, was, an independ ind was independently associated with survival. And another study, this one is from Korea. So this group looked at their entirety of uh, resected patients with ductal adenocarcinoma, looked at recurrence patterns, and uh, also what they did for the recurrence. And they uh, did a re-resection with curative intent in 48 patients. So that's 0.06% of their overall collective. So this is a rare uh, situation. 
Uh, importantly, local regional recurrences in 27.2%, so consistent uh, with what we found and what the Hopkins group found. Uh, also important, only a minority had uh, their isolated local recurrence in the remnant pancreas, the majority around the vessels and in lymph nodes. And also here, um, uh, better survival with resection, but this may be due to bias. Similar than in our study, they looked into resection versus no resection in isolated recurrence in the remnant pancreas and also here a benefit of resection. Um, they also looked at metastatic uh, um, recurrence and uh, the effect of resection. So, so this is known uh, that in, in, in patients with metachronic isolated lung metastasis, uh, this can make sense uh, in liver metastasis, probably not so much. And um, um, as in many indications, uh, there is also, even if there is only a few small uncontrolled series, there is systematic review and meta-analysis here from, from uh, this Italy, uh, group from Italy. After our uh, series, there were five other series uh, published, um, some of them very recently, and um, all of them either from Japan or from um, South Korea. And overall, although there is of course a risk of bias, uh, clearly a better survival um, for if the patients undergo redo surgery with resection. And finally, um, of course, the field uh, changes as also Deshan has um, elucidated to uh, with more, more potent uh, chemotherapy regimens such as Folfirinox. So this is a game changer also uh, in, in, in the recurrence uh, setting. Uh, this is a um, patient with uh, big re local recurrence in the mesenteric root after whipple resection. Uh, it was unresectable before neoadjuvant or pseudo-neoadjuvant therapy, and it here still looks unresectable, but this is the situs after resection, just like in a locally advanced pancreatic cancer. Uh, this was done with a divestment of the supramesenteric artery, the celiac trunk, portal vein resection, and, uh, and not even a total pancreatectomy or completion pancreatectomy, this is the pancreatic remnant, uh, this was a Whipple procedure or a redo Whipple procedure. And um, so I think with more um, potent new adjuvant chemotherapy regimens, uh, these cases will, will also increase. Um, finally, we will update the Heidelberg experience. Um, um, and now we have uh, almost, or we have 142 patients who underwent uh, resection for recurrent pancreatic cancer and the overall survival is 24.5 months, five-year survival of 17.3 months after re-resection. And uh, this collective will allow to look more closely into factors that allow us better to probably make uh, decisions in the future. But my overall conclusion is it is worthwhile in selected patients. We do not know yet uh, how to select the patients best. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Oliver, for your excellent presentation. Um, uh, that was great. I enjoyed a lot and learned a lot. Thank you. And we have a couple of questions. Um, there is one question from Aydin Dalgic from uh, Istanbul. Uh, uh, he would like to know regarding, um, yeah, he would like to know the role of adjuvant chemotherapy following uh, redo surgery in pancreas. Um, very good question. <laughs> uh, I, unfortunately, I cannot give the answer, um, but um, so I think the situation is, is so, so we, um, we recommend adjuvant therapy, another round of adjuvant therapy in, this, in these patients. And, uh, but, but of course we don't have a control group, so I cannot say uh, that, that it really helps, but um, 
of course, also in these recurrent diseases, um, it should be multimodal therapy. So, so that's our recommendation. Um, I think it's a little bit similar to locally advanced pancreatic tumor receiving neoadjuvant therapy and resection. There is now increasing evidence that also in this setting, uh, uh, additional adjuvant therapy makes sense. So I would say, yes, uh, we, we, we should recommend it if the patient can take it, and, but uh, there is no clear, clear data for it at this point. Okay. Um, any other question? Um, do you believe in that there is any limit for adjuvant treatment in case of um, isolated metastasis? For example, when do you decide to stop doing adjuvant chemotherapy and go to surgery? Any, is it dependent to the time or just dose of chemotherapy or the patient's condition? Which one? Um, <clears throat> so this is a difficult question because we see, so, so in the Heidelberg experience, we see different kinds of patients um, because of referral patterns. Um, some of the patients, they have an early recurrence, but, but as I pointed out, this may not be early recurrence, this may be persistence. If this occurs during chemotherapy, I think it makes no sense to do the operation. If, if you have a, this is a progression during chemotherapy, that's not a good, not, not a good um, situation for surgery. Um, otherwise, um, I think uh, the patient, if you do, if, if there is a recurrence after chemotherapy, most of the patients that we operated on had their recurrence, had then the chemotherapy, and then there was a, a, a follow-up exam with, which was clean, as I have shown you the pictures, and then there was a regrowth of tumor. And there I would not do neoadjuvant therapy, we would just do a resection and then do an adjuvant therapy, unless probably in patients with a very high C99 or a tumor where you think you cannot do a radical resection, then a neoadjuvant setting and then surgery. Okay. Um, thank you, Oliver. Uh, the, another, another question from Ankara, from Mustafa Kerem. Um, do, you think, do you think that the timing of recurrence uh, uh, have any, has any effect on your decision? For example, uh, is your attitude different if recurrence occurs in first year or later than first year? Yes, so, so this is um, again um, difficult because we cannot at this point uh, distinguish a true recurrence from a persistence and probably uh, the lymphadenectomy and the perivascular dissection was not performed uh, you know, to current standards because uh, these standards also developed over time. I think uh, as we do now pancreatic surgery more radical around the vessels, we will see, uh, we will less frequently see early recurrent, early local recurrence. Patients will still get early systemic recurrence, but the rate of early local recurrence will probably decrease. And uh, overall, of course, uh, but, uh, it would make sense or uh, thinking is, uh, the, the later the recurrence, the better the biology and the better also the, the, the prospect after surgery and probably the, the survival gain. Um, but, uh, but our data didn't show this, but probably it didn't show it because we, we, we, we, we did a, a selection based on this uh, thinking. So, so then you cannot analyze it anymore because you have a bias exactly with this aspect. Yes. And another question from Spain, uh, Alejandro. Um, when do you decide to do intraoperative radiotherapy? What's your protocol? The first question. The second one, in local recurrence, do you perform resection in arterial involvement? If yes, in what cases? Which cases? So to, so to the first question, uh, IORRT, we, so, so um, we mainly did IORT in the early times when Volfirinox was not um, yet available. 
And uh, the, our preferred regimen of neoadjuvant therapy was, or of, of therapy for, for locally advanced cases, was uh, chemo radiation. And, and in the context of chemo radiation, we augmented the dosage by intraoperative radiation. With Fulfirinox, uh, the, um, the contribution of, of radiation, including intraoperative radiation, decreased. Um, we would do this probably in very rare cases uh, that uh, received uh, neoadjuvant chemo radiation, huh? that still receive neoadjuvant chemo radiation. And the second uh, question if we would do arterial resections. Um, in which cases? In which cases? I, I would only say in very selected cases. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the last question is um, Do you? Consider do perform a resection if uh, you uh, have excellent result from Fulfirinox treatment uh, in liver tumors, and if you have got negative PET scan, do you still consider to go to operating theater or just follow the patient? Then? Um, yeah, so so this is um, we, we would do this. Um, so are, are you talking about synchronous or metachronic metastatic disease? Uh, metachronous. Metachronous. Uh, so, so for metachronous metastasis, we we if if they occur uh, in with a long interval after the resection, we would go for surgery after a meticulous follow up, including PET scan. Um, if, if it occurs early, we would do palliative therapy. And then if there is a good response, then we may consider it, but it's certainly better if you have a long interval. And, and there is actually a study on this uh, that was performed in Vienna, uh, here, um, that, that shows that the interval is relevant. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think there's no more question. Um, thank you, Oliver, one more time for your excellent presentation. And thank you for uh, meeting with us in Turkish HVB webinars. And hope to see you by personally soon in healthy conditions, of course. Thank you. And I, I thank you. And it was really my pleasure. And that, that, that's an excellent um, um, uh, um, congress or, or webinar you do. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, our last speaker. Uh, in this webinar is going to be Mustafa Adam, Professor Mustafa Adam from Lyon, France, and he's going to talk about the ERAS in uh, pancreatic and HPV surgery. Yes, uh, Mustafa. Th thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ozden. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you today. Uh, I will share my screen. Just let me know if it's okay. Yes, it's okay. Yeah, we see. Yeah. That's good. Okay, thank you. So my, my talk today is about the ERAS uh, program in pancreatic surgery. ERAS goes for enhanced recovery after surgery, as you know. Uh, we are going to talk about what is ERAS, the challenges in pancreatic surgery, uh, does it work, the causes of failure, and how to succeed the ERAS program, particularly in pancreatic surgery. First of all, some uh, historical um, event. First, in the 60s, the one-day surgery was developed uh, mainly in the U.S. in cardiac surgery to, to reduce the uh, time or length of hospital stay and reduce the cost. In the 80s, uh, we have the uh, event of the laparoscopic surgery, and this led to the development of the fast-track surgery. And then in, after 2000, we have the program of uh, ERAS. So first... Um, if we ask uh, the audience who knows ERAS, usually 100% will say, yes, we know ERAS. If we ask who do ERAS, we fall to 40% of the participants would say, yes, we do ERAS in our department. But if you go to the uh, department and you look who is really doing ERAS, this fall to 1%. So usually surgeons think they are stronger than they are really are in the real life. Usually there is confusion between the fast track and the ERAS program. The first the objective of the fast track is to reduce the cost, 
And how we can achieve it is by using the minimally invasive surgery. The outcome, we look for the less length of stay in the hospital and of course, less cost. But the inconvenience is we have to do patient selection for the fast track program. And there is high rate of readmission, almost 20 to 30% readmission when we use the fast track. On the other hand, the ERAS objective are totally uh, opposite to the fast track because the uh, goal of ERAS is to improve the quality of care and the patient is implicated in his or her treatment. We look to reduce the stress and the perioperative complication. And then we have a lateral or collateral effect, which are the uh, reduced length of stay, uh, reduce the uh, health cost without increase in hospital readmission. So we see clearly that there is differences between the fast track program and ERAS program. The ERAS, uh, sorry, ERAS concept is usually based on evidence-based medicine. However, not all the uh, items used in ERAS are evidence-based, but they are um, uh, taken from uh, practice in uh, the literature and published data. So it's a perioperative multimodal care pathway uh, aiming for early recovery of the patient. We have to re-examine the traditional practice we have in our uh, surgery and covering all area of the patient journey, not only uh, the operative aspect or uh, the surgery. And there is no patient selection, which is a very important point in, in the ERAS. And we'll see that uh, more, most complicated or, or fragile uh, or frail patient will benefit from uh, ERAS uh, than the patient who are in, in good condition. First recommendations were published in 2005. First, it started by an academic group in 2001. And then the ERAS Society uh, was um, built in 2010. And the first recommendation was uh, published uh, at that time. So as you see, it took almost 10 years to change. But if we look to the history, it's even longer because the prehabilitation program started really after the Second World War. In Her Majesty the Queen, the army was looking for a new uh, recruitment of young uh, uh, British, but most uh, young men were fragile, had psychological and mental uh, fragility after the war. So they started the program of prehabilitation with proper housing, good eating, sport, and the result was improving in the physical condition and even in mental performance. So the idea of prehabilitation is uh, almost now more than 60 years old. And I would say it's even older than this. <coughs> in France, in Lyon, we have a surgeon called Claude Poutou in the 18th century. He was working in the Hotel Dieu hospital and he found that the patient were after surgery were suffering from pain, from stress and infection. And many of them died because of uh, complication from infection and, and stress, perioperative stress, et cetera. And he started a program uh, asking to shorten the patient preparation, shorten the length of stay. He asked the patient to bring all their um, towel and dressing from home, not using contaminated towel and dressing from the hospital. So this is very, very old concept to improve the perioperative care of patients. The ERAS Society published guidelines in colonic surgery, pancreatic, rectal and pelvis, and other uh, uh, surgical speciality, which are uh, accessible on, on, on the website of the ERAS Society. As you can see, you can uh, look for them on this uh, web uh, site. So the guideline for pancreatic odiodenectomy you have here, we have almost 20 items. You can uh, stratify them into preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative items. If you look for the patient journey, the patient start by uh, looking for uh, or seeing the surgeon in, in the outpatient. He should get information. There is no need for bowel preparation. We have to get a, a small incision as uh, possible. No nasogastric tube after surgery. 
no drain uh, as a systematic uh, in pancreatic surgery, use of laxative and early oral feeding. The anesthetists also give information. There is no pre-anesthetic medication and there is carbohydrate load giving uh, feeding, uh, control of hypothermia, epidural analgesia uh, to control the amount of fluid given to the uh, patient, prevention of nausea and vomiting and oral analgesic. And you need also the participation of paramedical nurses, physiotherapists, nutritionists, etc., to give information, patient education, help in mobilization and early oral feeding. So you see all the team should participate in the program. One of the major problems we have in pancreatic surgery is undernutrition. We can see from uh, this uh, uh, paper in 2007 that pancreatic cancer patients are, are usually old patients. They have low albumin uh, level and they are high risk of uh, undernutrition and post-operative complication. So in the ERAS program, there is no systematic preoperative artificial nutrition. They privilege oral feeding and uh, nutritional uh, supplement orally. Immune nutrition was uh, proposed in the first recommendation, but in the revised one, immune nutrition is no more mandatory before surgery for, for all patients. Second problem we have in pancreatic surgery, especially pancreatic head tumor, is the jaundice and the endoscopic biliary drainage. We know from this study in 2010, randomized study, that uh, preoperative endoscopic biliary drainage increases the postoperative morbidity and complication and should be uh, avoided uh, as much as we can. So we should privilege early uh, uh, surgery, no routine uh, biliary drainage unless the patient has other comorbidity as uh, renal uh, failure related to uh, hyperbilirubinemia or liver dysfunction, or if the cutoff level of bilirubin is superior to 250, because this is the cutoff which was selected in the randomized study. Preoperative fasting also should be avoided. We know that uh, preoperative fasting increases the stress and insulin resistance. So the patient will receive carbohydrate load uh, the day before the surgery at midnight or before sleep. And then two hours before surgery, they receive again carbohydrate load. And we know from the physiology of our medical study that two hours before surgery, the stomach is usually empty and there is no risk for uh, uh, inhalation during the induction of anesthesia. The stress is also very important. So as you have seen, all the uh, team will participate in giving information, the surgeon, the anesthetist, and the paramedical. We have to educate the patient for the surgery, explain his journey uh, in the hospital, the carbohydrate load, we talk about it, and we don't need pre-anesthetic medication. The patient can go without any pre-anesthetic uh, medication to the theater. As you see, this is one of our patients going to the OR for pancreatic surgery. And you see he's smiling, very happy, no stress. And we look for uh, our cases, 100% of patient goes now to the operating theater walking. The waiting time is less than 10 minutes uh, since the time they arrived to the OR and 90%, 95% were very satisfied by this uh, procedure. IV fluid should be uh, reduced. We know that uh, we have to use a guided policy to improve the perioperative outcome over uh, perfusion of fluid can induce complication as anastomotic uh, leakage. This was clearly shown in colorectal surgery. So we uh, usually use the transesophageal Doppler to monitor the uh, IV fluid during uh, surgery. And as, as you can see, when we implement the uh, ERAS program, you see that there is improvement in uh, before and after. This is the amount of fluid giving to uh, the patient uh, before and after the ERAS program. And you see the patient are receiving less uh, fluid. And then we privilege the uh, oral uh, fluid as much as we can and as early as we can after the surgery. And the objective is to reduce then less than three uh, liter of uh, fluid perfusion during a Whipple procedure. This is the cutoff 
uh, we have for this uh, surgery. Abdominal drainage, it's a big debate. There is a lot of paper. What we know for sure that uh, early drain removal is uh, recommended. And we uh, recommend in the ERAS program a selective drainage in patients with high post-operative uh, fistula uh, risk. This patient should be drained. If you have a hard, firm pancreas with large duct, you may not to do systematic drainage. So we have to use selective drainage and early removal, no routine drainage in pancreatic surgery. Pain control is also uh, very important. You see early mobilization if the patient, this is patient operated for a Whipple procedure on day one, uh, he's out of the bed walking outside. This is an 82 years old patient, two hours after uh, returning fr from the OR after a Whipple procedure, he is sitting in his chair and quite happy. And you can achieve this by an appropriate analgesia, which is privileged for epidural and multimodal and no opioid, prevention of uh, uh, nausea and vomiting, and you see there is no nasogastric tube uh, after uh, surgery. Patient going to pancreatic duodenectomy, you see if, uh, we have a lot of, of uh, data showing that most of the items could uh, be done uh, very efficiently in most of uh, cases with good result when compared to control group. The morbidity is uh, reduced, but the mortality and readmission rate are not increased when you implement the uh, program, the ERAS program. When you look to the uh, different type of uh, surgery, comparing to uh, the cost of surgery in control group and ERAS group, and you see whether pancreatic or duodenectomy and total pancreatectomy, distal pancreatectomy, et cetera, you see that with reducing the post-operative or perioperative complication, you reduce the cost compared to a control group. So you can also have financial benefit beside the uh, improvement of uh, the patient after surgery. So we uh, look for the patient before the ERAS, patient receiving not all of the full ERAS program, uh, what we call the ERAS-like. These are patients receiving some of the item of the ERAS program and the patient receiving the full ERAS program. And you see that you have improvement in the outcome. If you use some of the ERAS program, you improve your out, the patient outcome. And if you use the full ERAS program, you have better uh, results after surgery. In our experience, we started by implementing uh, the program with the team of uh, Nicolas de Martin from Lausanne. You always need an expert team to implement the program. And you see everyone do some of the ERAS. So we had about 43% of the items of ERAS already done in our department without, um, let's say, knowing that we are doing some of the ERAS program. But after the ERAS program, we reach up to 86%. The, the main level, I mean, of uh, improvement is when you reach 70%. This is the ideal. And if you can do more, it's, uh, it's uh, even better. But 70% is the um, level where you get the best outcome for the patient. Uh, when you look to different, see this, some of the item of the uh, ERAS program, you see some of them are very good, 100%. Some of them are less as the abdominal drain. Uh, this does not mean that there is a failure in the program. It's only because the ERAS program should be adapted to uh, each uh, patient, even in mobilization. Some of patients cannot uh, stay out of the bed for the six hour a day as recommended by the ERAS program. So this is not a problem. If the patient can only stay one or two hours, it's okay. And then with time, uh, they can stay a longer time. Uh, if you look to the item of the ERAS, this is before uh, the implementation of the program, and this is after the implementation of program, and you see we have more and more item implemented uh, after uh, we start uh, the uh, program. And there is also a clear correlation between the compliance and the length of stay. You see when the compliance increase, the length of stay will also uh, decrease uh, in the same uh, or in the opposite uh, direction. 
For the pancreatectomy, we look for the uh, outcome comparing a cont with the control group. You see that the morbidity is reduced. The severe morbidity, uh, Clavian did do three, four, is also reduced. The mortality is reduced. The rate of fistula, hemorrhage, reoperation, and length of stay is also clearly reduced after surgery. Readmission is about 7%, uh, which is uh, not very high for uh, pancreatic surgery. And this you see before and after the admission rate. And this is the intervention rate before and after the implementation of the ERAS program. You can also benefit from uh, the ERAS program, especially in the ICU and in uh, the high dependence. Uh, in the lower uh, right uh, diagram, you see these are patients going back directly to the surgery ward, and this patient in the high dependence, and this is the patient in ICU. So patients don't go anymore to the high dependence or uh, ICU after uh, Whipple uh, or any pancreatic surgery unless there is uh, severe comorbidities. So there is also benefit in um, the hospital organization, the access uh, to the ICU bed and high dependency. So how to succeed ERAS? You have to get an implementation plan to organize a team. You have to get three leaders, the surgeon, anesthetist, and a nurse. You have to get the guideline and the protocol. You organize the data collection, and then you have to write your own protocol. There is uh, in, uh, no um, book uh, to, to do the ERAS. You have to get the uh, recommendation, all the item, and then you write your, all, your own protocol. Start the process of implementation, information of the team, education of the team, and the data collection is mandatory. And then you get the data analysis. You adjust if there is some uh, deviation from the uh, program. You can look for your compliance and look how you can improve the outcome for the patient by correcting some deviation in, uh, in the program. So the audit is also mandatory. And in the beginning, we had uh, an audit every week. And then once the program is going uh, on a regular basis, we have an audit every month uh, to adjust any deviation from uh, the ERAS protocol. You have also a patient roadmap. The patient had a lot of information and have a book that uh, he do the, his homework while he's in, the, in his uh, bed in the hospital and he fill all the uh, data. And so we can collect them and analyze and see if everything is going as we expect. You have also the interactive audit system from the uh, ERAS Society. This is a very um, uh, nice uh, database which you can use and collect all your data. And it's uh, much better than having the Excel sheet uh, because you can analyze all the items you have. You can look to the pre-operative items, intra-operative, the post-operative, and you see usually pre-operative, you had very high compliance. Uh, intra-operative, uh, it fails a little bit, and the post-operative is much uh, lower, of course, and we can understand this. If we look for uh, the outcome uh, and the uh, success of the uh, ERAS program, this is uh, depending on uh, the, all the team. And you see that those who have the most resistance to change practice are the surgeon and anesthetist. So the most difficult part is to change the practice of the surgeon and the anesthetist. The patient uh, is on the second position and nurses and the paramedical team are more keen to change practice, as you see, than the surgeon and the anesthetist. So this is very uh, important. There is a lot of work to do with the surgery team and the anesthetist team uh, to change the protocol and many of the dogma we have in uh, surgery. So you have an integrated ERAS protocol that uh, can be done for the implementation program. And you see the patient is always in the center of the care, but the patient you have around him, many uh, uh, team are uh, uh, working around the patient, the physician, the nurses, the medical staff, the surgeon, anesthetist, paramedical, you have the evidence-based, 
the operating room, the data from the literature, but you have also other factors which can influence and impact your program. Uh, the hospital administration, the cost of the hospital, the pharmaceutical industry, the ICU access and availability, uh, the war, the income, and then you have on the national level also many items who can intervene and may affect the practice around the patient. So the patient is not only isolated in a surgery ward, all these factors may impact the journey of the patient and we have to be very careful about all uh, of the um, problem who can interfere with uh, patient care. Finally, I would say we have the old world and the new world. Here you have uh, the Ferrari team in 1952, and this is in 2007. And you see to change a the wheel, they spend more than half an hour. And now they spend less than three seconds in changing the four wheel of the Ferrari. So the ERAS program is a new world. We have to change the dogma to change our practice to get a better outcome for our patient. We have to start by a proper implementation. We have to look for our compliance to the program. We have to change practice by uh, giving an end to the dogma, the many dogmas we have in, in surgery. We have to get a coordination. Uh, nurse coordination for the program and overall a teamwork. Thank you for your attention and I will be happy uh, to respond to the question. Um, thank you Mustafa for your excellent speak and um, we have already got two questions. One of them um, is from Ankara Haldun Gündoğdu, the president of Turkish Era Society and he would like to know uh, about your surgeon's attitude to ERAS. Do all surgeons in your department or around you, you use ERAS program in your hospital or unit? What do you think? Uh, yes, now in, in my unit, all the patients are in ERAS program. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started, we started with the pancreatic surgery and then with the colorectal surgery. We started with pancreatic surgery because I was the, the leader of the program. So I said that we start with the pancreas and if we succeed, then everyone will be convinced that it, it works. Uh, it took for all the team between one to two years uh, to make all the surgeons participate in, in the program. Um, uh, the main uh, point is you, you don't have to force anyone to go to the ERAS uh, program. Um, we started, as I said, by the pancreas, and then uh, some of the patients um, were doing uh, part of the ERAS program in, in colorectal or esogastric or whatever. And then we said, okay, uh, you see, we, we talked to the surgeon saying, okay, your patient are doing this and this and this, and all these items, these three or five or seven items are from the ERAS program so can we increase and if they are happy we increase the items gradually and uh, then they see that the outcome is very good the patient are, are very happy uh, so we have to go uh, gradually okay and, and and then another point is very important if you look for the pancreas or colorectal you have usually between 20 or 23 items to do you cannot um, change the practice and implement 20 items in one week or in one month. Uh, for the pancreas, it took one year to implement all the items for the pancreatic surgery. You know, because you say, okay, we start with uh, item number one, six, five, uh, 12, etc. And then it works and we add two or three other items because it should go gradually for the surgeon, for the anesthetist and for the team. Okay. We have two more questions, Mustafa. The first one is related to the first, uh, the first question is related to the previous one, actually. Do you believe in that there are some core ERAS factors and also side factors? Uh, or ERAS is just a unit, it cannot be separable from each other. What do you think? For, for the item? Yes, for the items criteria. No, no, criteria. no, no, no, no, not at all. I mean, um, if you do uh, what we call an ERAS-like, you, you don't do, let's say you have 20 items, you, you only do 10 items, okay? It, it's better than, than doing only two. And if you do 15, it's better than doing 10. And if you do 20, 
uh, is excellent. Okay? But any, any 10 of them, not some mandatory things. I mean, uh, there is not any core items. I mean, no, no, there, there is no item that seems superior uh, to, to yeah. the other. I think the one of the main um, principle of the idea uh, in the ERAS is the teamwork. Okay, if you set a, a program and all the team uh, is adherent to, to this program uh, in a teamwork, this change the outcome of, of the patient. And I think this is more important than each item separate. Okay. All right. And there's one more from Ilgin Özden. Oh, sorry, Dejan, I'm going to give it. All right. The Ilgin Özden preoperative pre -operative endoscopic drainage changes the bile flora to a more antibiotic resistant pattern. Uh, this is not the case with percutaneous external drainage with, of course, oral ursa deoxycholic acid if the tip of the catheter is kept in the supraampullary area. And would you recommend the percutaneous route in patients with uh, with uh, need uh, any need to preoperative drainage? Uh, good question. No, we we in in our center we don't do uh, percutaneous drainage uh, unless there is a critical situation that we cannot do endoscopic drainage. What we try to do is before drainage, there should be discussion between the surgeon and the uh, endoscopist. So we discuss all cases before uh, deciding to drain or not to drain, okay? Even sometimes the patient on, is on in endoscopy on the table and the endoscopist will call, okay, there is a tumor, what we should do. If we can, the main question is, can we operate the patient quickly? If we can operate the patient quickly, we don't drain. If we say, no, the patient has comorbidity, he should go to uh, cardiac evaluation or whatever, we put the, the drain and we usually use uh, endoscopic drain. The disadvantage is you have risk of, of pancreatitis, which is low, but sometimes it's severe pancreatitis. And we have about 7% of patients who had post-endoscopic um, pancreatitis. Uh, post-drainage pancreatitis, they are not resectable. They were explored and not resectable because of the uh, pancreatitis. Okay. Um, the problem of external drainage, it's um, not very convenient for, for the patient to have an, a drain from for the outside. And, and usually uh, when you use a percutaneous drain, you internalize the drain. Otherwise, you lose the benefit uh, of the bile going in the uh, uh, gastric uh, flow. No. Okay. Uh, Dejan, I think you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Mustafa, for excellent presentation. Uh, really excellent and very educated. But I see the several problems within the eras. You know, we, we talked several times. And uh, first, I think that the weakest point is a surgeon. Because when we are talking with the surgeons, first biggest problem is nasogastric intubation. Mm -hmm. And around, I think, roughly 70% of the surgeons will adapt to that uh, naso, naso, nasogastric tube removal on the OR table, but others will, will not do it for sure. I, I feel in, in, in, my, in my practice, in my, because you cannot convince them that they have to take it out. Control of the bleeding, you know, the, the light gastric cavity. And also the problem with the antibiotic prophylaxis is that in ERAS program, uh, surgeons at least two or three days will give the antibiotics. If you ask them to, or if you have some, some question, I'm pretty sure that it will, how we can convince those guys to, to follow the program. I don't, I don't think to push them, but maybe we need more studies. And of course, the story about the drains, it's, it's still the unresolved story in pancreas surgery. And if we would like to, to talk about the complete ERAS compliance, but, and the, not, and the last point is about the differences between epidural and uh, patient control analgesia. I think that still there is studies which say that now it's equal. And then they are coming with the papers, you know, randomized trial say that it's equal via using epidural, not using patient control. Thank you. Yeah, N nasogastric tube um, in, in the practice of ERAS in pancreatic odiodenectomy, uh, for about 40% of the patient will need to reinsert the nasogastric tube. 
within the first three post-operative day, okay? But this is not failure of the ERAS because 60% of the patient will not need the nasogastric tube. So they, can, they have better mobilization, they can get oral feeding more quickly, okay? And it's, it's always the same. If the surgeon want to do some of the ERAS and not uh, removing the nasogastric tube at the end, it's okay, it's not a problem, okay? Later on, he will change his mind and maybe he will, he will progress. Uh, so there is no forcing for, for the uh, items in, in the ERAS. The second uh, point is antibioprophylaxis. Antibioprophylaxis, I think we have a lot of uh, data. We don't use any more three-day antibiotic. I mean, it's nonsense. We, we, we only do the preoperative antibioprophylaxis within, it should be done um, within one hour before the incision and then it's okay. And even patient with uh, biliary stent, we always do um, bacterial examination of the bile. Uh, even if the bile is contaminated, if the patient is not septic, we don't give antibiotics. We only have the, the uh, microorganism, the bacteria, and then we can adapt if the patient develop infection or, or, or whatever. Uh, the third question, uh, remind me, the third question was, uh, Dejan? Yeah, the third question was was about the about the about the drain removal, drain story. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, so the, the drain we we uh, had three phases. First, we drain all the patient, and then we stop draining all the patient. Okay, and we look to the data. And now, what we do since uh, five years now, we do selective drain selective drain and early removal. And we use two parameter, uh, soft pancreas and or small duct. If the patient has small duct and or soft pancreas, we drain. Otherwise, we, we, we don't drain. And then we, ha we, we do the early removal. I think everyone is okay for early removal. But the main question is where to put the drain? This is very, very crucial. We also changed several times in the position of, of the drain. And now we use, uh, since we started the selective drain, we, only, we put only two drain at both sides of the anastomosis. We do pancreatogastric. So one drain is behind the stomach in front of the uh, pancreas along the anastomosis. And the second drain is below the anastomosis. And these are drains, uh, what we call in France, the Shirley drain, where you can do irrigation lavage. So if you have fistula, we start immediately uh, irrigation lavage. Uh, and we, we, ha we are happy with, with, with, this, uh, with this technique. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mustafa, again. And um, since there's not any further question, I think it is time to go. Oh, okay, Oliver, I'm sorry. Yes, please go ahead. Oliver, could you please turn uh, your- Yes, um, Mustafa, I enjoyed uh, your talk very much. I have one question. Um, so although there is no evidence, uh, a lot of people think that a neo strategy uh, should be done also in resectable disease for pancreatic cancer. Uh, from the side of ERAS, what is your position? What will be the effect of such a strategy for the for ERAS in pancreatic surgery or patients in, in pancreatic surgery yeah. in patients with cancer? I, I think it should not change any, anything in, in the ERAS program because we all we also have the patient with borderline or locally advanced who get neoadjuvant treatment and then they are operated and they are all in the ERAS program. I would say the more critical your patient is, the more he will benefit from the ERAS. The main point uh, for the ERAS program is, it's not a, um, you know, a research protocol that you have to do all the item, otherwise it, it's not uh, valid. The ERAS program mm. should be adapted to the patient. Okay, so as I said, if the patient uh, could not uh, eat, okay, it's not a problem, he will not eat. If the patient cannot walk, uh, we start with 50 meter and then we go to 100 and then 150, we have a circuit in the department. So if the patient cannot do the, the distance, it's not a problem. You have clearly to adapt all the item to the patient condition. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I think we are all done. Thank you. Thank you for all your participations and nice talks. And I, we enjoyed a lot, of course, as usual. And I hope to see you all in near future in healthy conditions, of course, by personally either in Turkey or somewhere else. But it is the important, I think the only important thing is the health nowadays, especially. Would you like to say a couple of words, Igin, for closure? Just, I would like to express our gratitude to the international experts for sharing their wonderful experience with us. And thank you to all the participants. I wish all of you a happy weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye bye. You very much. Thank you. Bye. You can take you. Bye. Bye. bye. bye. Thank you.